Hello and welcome to the Magic of Podcast. Today, my very special guest is a good friend of mine, a lady by the name of Catherine Mills. Catherine is a magician, a mind reader or mentalist. She was the first woman to have her own mind reading show on television. Um, Catherine, what do you do? Tell tell us about yourself. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, well, I guess I do what most magicians do. I, I do uh, a kind of mixture of uh, visual magic and cards and uh, using props and things like that. And then I also do uh, mentalism as well. So I kind of, yeah, I do a mixture of both. Yeah, but you didn't, you, you were quite considered in the, the stuff that you did, uh, move, certainly moving into mentalism, I believe, you know, you, you, you've got quite a, quite a wide range of magic, incorporating magic as like everything, it's not just doing card tricks, it's doing mind reading, you do a bit of everything. Yeah, I do a bit of everything, but I think, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think a lot of magicians do a little bit of everything, and I think I've probably just been fortunate enough to sort of opportunity to come my way which has sort of forced me or fast-tracked me to sort of get into new things and to come up with material and stuff. What really excited you about magic? Um, well when I first started? Yeah. Or, um, I think probably what excites anybody into magic like it's a kind of it's exciting, it's mysterious, it's engaging, um, it gives you a very unique feeling. I think I was probably a kind of uh, a really uh, great punter for anybody. I was, I, I was really enthusiastic to, you know, if magic was performed on me. I remember going to my first uh, convention and I was just so enthusiastic and so reactive. Um, so, yeah, I, I, th- I think probably what kind of attracts most people to magic. Was that convention the one we met at? That was. That was the first convention. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I, don't, I can't remember how long ago was that. That was like maybe... Well, you like, started, I think, about a year after me, literally. Yeah. yeah. I so mean, how long have you been magic now? Oh, my God. Um, it must have been around 2006, 2005. So I think you that must have been 2007. Yeah, maybe two thousand and seven. Yeah, like thirteen years ago. So yeah, so a long time ago. Yeah. But yeah. So that magic convention where I met where I met you, I was like, I was just so excited. I was excited about so many things about magic. First of all, because the mystery of it was still massive for me. I had no idea how anything was done. Um, I thought it was so much more appealing than a kind of uh, any kind of desk job or it would give me opportunities to travel and things like that um and I think I you know I'm still there are more women now than there ever have been but certainly at that point there were very very few women and I'd never heard of any so I thought you know I'd be very rare in in that world so I thought that was an exciting prospect for me too so when you went to the convention was that just to to check it out or were you actually thinking I'm going to become a professional or you, you were yeah. you just testing the water yeah when i went to that convention that was with the mindset of i want to become a magician so oh, wow. i found out about that convention through sav um because i so i met sav at an event that i was doing a kind of work experience that i thought maybe i'll do event planning or event organizing something like that so sav just so, to, to fill in sav is a a really great um close-up magician in in london and he's been doing it for a long time yeah and you so you saw him at a gig or something or what happened yeah so he was just he was just doing a, a normal gig for him and it was him and dynamo that were at this gig and i remember kind of floating around i didn't really know what i was supposed to be doing i was doing work experience i was given a few jobs but not much so i was able to stand around and watch the magicians and so what was this they, job what was this job you were doing there what what was it it was it was actually the uh blackberry pearl mobile phone launch right 
did you have Ages to? Ago. Here's the black. Did you have to like hold up the BlackBerry for everybody or what? Uh, my job was to let Razor light on stage, which was actually really exciting and, okay. and cool. Um, but I, uh, but I also wanted to sort of see the magicians and, and that kind of stuff. And it was actually in that moment I remember seeing Dynamo doing a floating card and just. I mean, I, I was just, as I said, I was the perfect punter for anyone because I was just so enthusiastic and just, just loved it. Um, and then I remember that night I went back home to my mom and I said, oh, I think maybe I'd like to be a magician. She was like, that's, that's a nice idea. I was like, yeah, I think so. You know, I don't have to sit behind a desk. And I, you know, I, I just thought it was a fun idea. So the next time I then went to another one of these jobs, Sab was there and I said, look, can we go for a coffee? And we did, and that's when he told me about Blackpool, and that's when I, I went to Blackpool. Oh. So that's how it kind of started for me. And he said he told me to buy the book Magic for Dummies, which I did, <laughs> and then I got the Blackpool Magic Convention. So the Blackpool happened after the, the international before? Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, my mistake. No, I went first to international. Right. That was the first. Got to keep, uh, keep then, you in check. I remember. The, I was there. I remember it. Yeah. No, sorry, that's my mistake. So Blackpool was after International. International was the first one I went to. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I remember that was at a theatre on the Euston Road. It was a hotel on the Euston hotel. Road. Ibis, wasn't it? Which one was it? Ibis. Was it the Ibis? It? No, it had a... They, had, they must have had like a stage and because it moved a few times. Certainly afterwards it moved. And we used, we used to all hang about in the bar and there were people who would... Um, basically gate crash the convention not buy tickets and sit in the bar and just session up so they didn't go and see the shows but they because magicians love to session that's the thing yeah. isn't it yeah yeah exactly and that's and actually like you know i didn't the only thing i went to was i went into the dealers space which i didn't i didn't really get it and i was kind of i didn't know the right questions questions to ask so for me, it was in the bar, which is obviously where I met you and other magicians, and that's kind of was my first introduction to the world of magicians. And what do you do? You remember meeting me? Well, it was me and another magician called Max. I'm yeah. upset. I remember meeting both of you, and I had my friend there, Charlotte. Right. Um, yeah, I do. I mean, I just I do, and I remember uh, Lee was there as well. Um, and he was, I, I remember quite a lot. I think Hen, Neil Henry was there. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it was fun. And I, and everyone was showing me magic tricks and, you know, again, there was just no females there. It was such a kind of male dominated place. And, uh, and that's where I met Max and then Max obviously ended up mentoring me, uh, sort of weeks after meeting him there. So that's an interesting thing. So you being perhaps the only female, one of very few females there, certainly looking to get into magic at that time, or at least... Um, I, and I remember you you were asking kind of the right questions. You Because there, there were other women there, I remember, and there were some people I was friendly with, but they used to come because they just enjoyed the whole vibe and they ju- enjoyed being around magicians. But I remember clearly that you were asking about, yeah, but what about that? And what about this? And... What you know? If I did this and if I did that, I remember that you had that curiosity back then. I mean, I think I am very curious, and maybe I'm really delusional, and I sound like an absolute nightmare to perform to. But I thought I'd probably be really enthusiastic. Um, but I, yeah, I guess maybe <laughs> maybe I would have been a bit of a nightmare. Um, but I was definitely interested in it, and I remember, uh, yeah, I remember Sav showing me a coin unique and just being like, you know so enthusiastic and thought it was amazing meaning an original coin there yes <laughs> um so i'm interested to know because you know we're, we're moving into this uh interesting age we're in uh in terms of the time epoch that we're living in at the moment uh i don't think i ever used the word epoch but i just did and um it's interesting, you know, you've been very successful as a f- female magician. And I think, I hope that it's becoming less about you being a female magician and more about you just being a magician. Do you think that's happened at all? 
Um, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I you know it's funny. A lot of people sort of, I think, say, oh, it must be hard, you know, being a female in a male-dominated industry. And actually, it's, I mean, from my experience, it's the complete opposite. I think, you know, doors are open to you because you're unique in that industry. So uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's something that I can sort of say step away from, but I think it's all very well, you know, being a certain person, but at the end of the day, you still have to deliver the goods. And if you can't deliver the goods, doors might open to you, but unless you can step up and, and perform and do what you're supposed to do, then it's, you're not going to stay there anyway and they'll soon you know, find someone else. Yeah, anyone can get a job uh, as a magician, especially with the internet. So yeah. people stick up their websites and people look online like, oh, award-winning magician, liar, liar, liar. And they watch these people and they can't perform. Now, you, or, in fact, you performed quite quickly, I think, from when you started Magic, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I performed very quickly. And, and weirdly, so I, a lot, through my career, I've, I've sort of felt like I've been sort of fast-tracked and almost kind of like, trying to play catch up on myself or trying to prepare myself for things which are imminent, but I should have done a lot more work to get there. So I remember after meeting Max at that convention, and then I think he phoned me maybe a few days later. And uh, I was, anyway, I was sort of confused about how I got my number and I was kind of confused about the whole thing. But he was also, very sneaky about getting your number. I remember that because you I left, do. you left your phone. I'm, I'm so scatty. I probably you yeah. went up to the room. I think you were staying there. Were you staying there? Uh, no, I don't know. I, I don't your, know why. Your we mate, went. your mate was staying there. Anyway, you left the phone downstairs, and Max saw the phone, and he he called his phone from your phone. I'm giving away wow. secrets here. Okay. And so then he had uh, your number. So then he had my number. So I, I I remember at the time being really confused about how he ended up phoning me, but anyway, he did, and I was working somewhere else at the time, and um, he said to me you know, I'm in BBC One Studios, we're looking for a female magician, what's your relationship with magic? And I, I was like, well, I don't really have one, I would just like to be a magician, that's where I'm at. And so then he said, well, you know, why don't you come up to London and I'll, I'll mentor you. And I remember, I was just so excited. I was, it would, to me, it was just like the most exciting thing. And I never really went to London very much. So um, I remember writing down Notting Hill Gate, which was where I, I met him. And I, jumped off the tube and we sat in a Starbucks and he started showing me stuff with cards. And I kind of had a, a fast track of three weeks of doing um, close-up magic, which then I ended up doing in an audition for um, Sorcerer's Apprentice, which I didn't get the job because I was horrific and I'd only been doing three weeks. Um, but I did get a kind of, a, ironically, a judge a position as a judge on the show. But I don't know if you remember, I, I don't think I actually had a speaking part. I think I just sort of sat there and clapped at the right moment. I remember you nodding in the audience. I think there's a clip of you and you're going... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of... Yeah, that was my... Uh, yeah, the extent of my performing in that. I was in that as well. You were? Were you a judge too? No, I was a mentor. Well, I was, uh, I was in for the um, uh, articulation. I taught them how to speak proper. Proper good English. Proper good English, right? Like it. Um, yeah. No. The yes. I uh, that was an interesting gig. That was that, and that was early days for both of us, actually. Yeah, very early days. But just thankfully, I wasn't allowed to speak uh, <laughs> in that job. So I mean, and 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 the whole uh, that whole audition. When I look back, I mean, it was just yeah. so cringeworthy. I kind of I wore this berry, and I had like. And Matt was giving me a cane, so I kind of like walked in. I mean, I just must have looked so bizarre. And then I remember I did, and again, I was only, I was like 22, 23. So, and I sort of was dressed up in this like odd outfit. And then I ended up doing um, a cigarette vanish with a, a, a flame wallet. Again, just completely obscure um, to do in this thing with like, you know, a young girl. But anyway, and that's why I didn't get the part. But, um, <laughs> but it was, I mean, I, I had a real fast track into it. And what a you know what an opportunity actually, um, yeah. You know because it, that was legit. That was a, so for those who don't know, it was a BBC show called The Sorcerer's Apprentice, 
which certainly in the first season, it went to three seasons, I think, and the second and third seasons were not great because they cut the money, which mm. is always the way. But it was a BBC show. The first season was really good, and it was based on uh, The Apprentice-type idea. That were, and so it was The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And these kids came in, and they were taught, and they competed. And I think, were they eliminated week by week or something like that? Yeah, I think so. But it was a very kind of charming English show. It was kind of, it was in, where was it? Was it in Somerset somewhere, I think? God, it was and miles it was in, away, I remember, yeah. Mall, and it was like this really charming old building. And, and, and just the magic was really fun. I think they did sort of, uh, they made a dog appear something didn't they they'd make, they'd make a St Bernard appear in that yes and Dynamo yeah. appeared in a in a barrel or something or box or something like that but it was really it was like it was very magical it was quite Harry Potter-esque for a you know just a, a children's BBC show it kind of had a real magical feel about the whole thing it was brilliant yeah um, it was a yeah. brilliant show and 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 Max is very um um how do you describe Max? He's very... Uh... Well, he's quite, he's quite magical, actually. He's very so, magical. Like, he's a very magical magician. So Eccentric. That was the word I was looking for, eccentric. Yeah, he's definitely eccentric, and he's got a kind of... Uh, he's very believable in that part. Like, if you ever thought you might genuinely meet a magician that has magical powers... Max would get away with that, I think, as a claim, whereas a lot of magicians, they wouldn't be able to get away with that. Etienne was in it. Etienne Pradier, wonderful magician, yeah. tip yeah. top, um, and but he's French, so um, but I, we, we don't hold that against him um, <laughs> a little bit. No, he was in that. He was great. Um, who else was in it? Um, oh, Tarek Knight. Tarek Knight. He was one of the main. He was the main guys, and and there was a female magician. There was a female, which is really cool. Was Sophie? Evans. Sophie. And she was great, and they were lovely. And I, I, I oh, um, David Penn was in it. Yeah, yeah, uh, it had a lot. Of, yeah, had some really good tip-top people, really tip-top. And so that's a you know that's a real opportunity. And obviously, that didn't put you off. That kind of inspired you even further, I think. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I was I was completely out of my depth. Like, you know, I can. I don't even know if I could. I could barely do a trick at that at that stage, and I was put on as a judge. I was just, thought, oh, please don't speak to me. I, you know, I, I was absolutely out of my depth. But at the same time, I kind of, I was kind of put. I was sort of ran before I could even walk. It was like I was then, and I quite quickly after that. You know, I was probably only doing magic for two years before I got my supply teacher audition. Um. But at that stage, I mean, I, you know, I remember I used to go out and go up into cafes and even at that stage, say before um, Sorcerer's Apprentice, I'd go into pubs and just walk up to random people and sort of do tricks on them. And, and, and it would always be a, the, the more I'd push myself and the better I'd sort of feel after doing it. And it was just about trying to practice and get my hours in and get used to being in different situations and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I really hit the ground running in that way. Um, but then, I mean, to be fair, but I think probably most people feel this, they always feel slightly like they're out of their depth and you know, just kind of hanging on. I don't think that changes, though. I think uh, we, we were talking about this before, before we, we started the podcast, that idea of worrying about the show that you're doing the the effects that you're doing putting the 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 plan together and even now 14 13 14 years later with all the experience under your belt and you've got a lot of experience you're still questioning yourself yeah i mean all the time and i'm and i'm constantly thinking i mean this sounds awful but do i want what i want to do and i'm and i and i constantly feel like a say a bit of a phony depends what mood I'm in but I can definitely feel like I'm just I don't have enough material like I'm uh, you know I'm about to do a stage show and it's like you know I just I just feel like I'm just never prepared enough or it's never and also what we were talking about earlier is that it's never you're never fully satisfied with what you're doing like by the time you get get there and you're performing it you're like "Mm, it's not really good enough 
and then you suddenly set your sights somewhere else. So it's kind of always chasing that feeling like you're you're good enough or you're, you've reached that, arrived at your destination. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough, but that's the. I think that's the curse of being a performer. I don't think it's. I don't think it's um, particular to magic. I think it's the same with acting. I yeah, think it's the same with any performance with an audience. Yeah, no, I think you're probably right. So it's just something that, but it's. I think it's. It can be a struggle because it, it. You can sort of get those highs and lows, and if a show goes well, then you're kind of you're flying and you just feel so good and so confident, but it's, it goes badly. You're just like, I knew it. Like, I'm just, I don't know enough and I'm, you know, not prepared enough and kind of go through all of that again. Did you feel um, accepted? I mean, the magic world, I think, is a very strong community. There is this collective. Um, I think once once you're in it, there's, there comes a point where you're kind of recognised and you become one of the boys or one of the girls and you're suddenly, I mean, I remember that. I remember sitting when I joined the Magic Circle uh, at the beginning, thinking, feeling like a fraud as well, and, you know, getting in and doing my act, which I was going to cancel like two weeks before. I thought, oh, I'm not ready. And, what, before your Magic Circle audition? Yeah, and you were around. You were, I was showing you my audition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How long have you been doing Magic before you did your audition? Oh, not long. I mean, it was like six months or I don't know. It wasn't long. I remember it was... Maybe it was the beginning of the year that I'd been scheduled in. And... I've been in magic for a year when I met you. Right. So but I must have been a member. Was I a member by then? Maybe I was a member by then. Maybe you were. I can't remember. Oh, no, I can't have been. No, because I would have been showing you. So maybe, yeah, I can't remember. It was something like that. But I remember that that kind of like, oh, my God, I'm not ready. And then yeah. getting in and then you're around people who you've you've you know as kind of big shots in magic, like, in the magic world, they're big shots. Uh, lay people wouldn't know half of these magicians. But... Mm, no, absolutely. And I, you know, I remember doing my magic circle audition so vividly. And for me, that was like a real uh, turning point, I'd say, and a real landmark for me in my career. Like that had such an impact on me. I don't think until that point, I'd never worked so diligently for anything. I was absolutely kind of, just so focused on it mainly because I was so terrified so it was that kind of the fear motivates you to keep on going and going um and so for a week I did nothing else but just perform this routine again and again and again and again and so much so that I remember on my way there sort of feeling like I just it was like an elation of like okay I, I know in my heart of hearts I've done everything I can do so when I did it it was like an out-of-body experience I just kind of did it automatically. I didn't really have to think about it. Um, and I was just, it was the first time I think I'd ever felt like I'm, I'm really pleased with how it went and I felt so proud of myself. And um, yeah, I was, I was just so happy and I worked so hard on it. You did. Um, and it was a really big deal for me becoming a member of the Magic Circle. You did the linking rings, I think, was one of the things. I think you did a mind reading thing. I, did you do a mind reading thing? I remember I you did, did the it. linking rings for sure because you were you were the the queen of that actually. Yeah, the linking rings girl. Um, I did uh, Coin Matrix. Mm-hmm. I did Strangers Gallery. Oh wow! I think yeah. Silver Brass as well. Yeah, you did some hardcore stuff. I mean, for people who yeah. don't know what that is, I mean, these are there are quite a, what's good about it. I think that's why you shone out as well, and that's why I talk about or ask about did you feel accepted and it's interesting to say that you did and you didn't feel that you were you, you were starved of opportunity or anything or you were i mean i, I maybe i'm putting words into your mouth but did you feel at any time you were the token female or did you feel like you were definitely yeah in some positions and did i always feel accepted i wouldn't say i I've, I've always found the magic community uh predominantly friendly like i've never sort of felt like they're not um inclusive but somehow i never really felt that feeling of having to prove yourself or feeling like am i good enough i don't think it's i don't think it's ever properly left me i think i've always felt a little bit like you know no matter how much i do it's never I don't, I'm, do you think that's a yeah. male female thing or do you think that's just about being a magician um 
I don't know. I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a male, female thing. I can only speak for myself, and that's how I felt. But um, generally, magicians have been really friendly, and I think that, as I said earlier, like for me being a female in the industry has only been a plus for me in terms of doors opening and things yeah. because if you're more unique, then it gives you something you know different to kind of... But more to the point, you were doing some seriously good magic back then because also you'd work with Max, you work with me, you work with Sav, you work with you work with a lot of uh, good yeah. people. And, and Faye, Faye Presto also uh, mentored me, so I would shadow her, and she'd be performing in Langham's, and um, and she was was very generous and sort of sweet with her time, and also just with her material. And she was just very welcoming, and I think because of being female in the industry, she felt quite protective and she sort of wanted to bring me under her wing and and help me you know so she was always really nice in that way yeah i had the same experience with Faye, but with my um cut and restored rope trick she taught me Uh, and uh you know and you picked up and what was great is you picked up all these things and then you you made them your own because you know you're not going to do it like Faye. you're going to do it like you you're going to the hardest thing i think with a lot of this stuff is finding who you are yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, even at the moment when I'm sort of working at the moment with a magician, it's all about that journey of like finding myself in my performance. And um, and, and I think, although it's been amazing, obviously, the opportunities I've had, I also think because I've always come from a place of uh, feeling like I'm, I'm having to kind of fast track, try and get ready underneath the thing just to step up and do it, that again, like the performance side of it or finding myself in that, it hasn't been, first of all, it hasn't been a priority because it's just about getting through it and making sure I'm delivering the magic in the right way. Um, but also because I don't think I've necessarily been in the right space to find myself in that, um, just because the, there's too much pressure. So I'm kind of try, trying to hold everything together. Um, and so the idea of me yeah, being able to have that sort of finding myself in that when you're nervous or trying to perform in front of a camera is quite difficult. It doesn't let you relax, kind of does the opposite. Do you still feel like that in front, in front of an audience, in front of a camera, or do you find that you've reached a point where, not so much that you don't feel like that, but that, that point where you jump off the diving board, you know, you're at that point where you literally, you just, and then you're, you know, there's no way back that moment where the curtains open, the audience is there, the camera's recording, whatever it is, and then you are exposed. And now, no matter what your script, anything can happen. Yeah, well, I know you're much more sort of freestyle than me. Like, you do, you know, all of your improv and stuff like that. I have never... I've never left things like that up to chance, and I've never sort of thought I'll wing it. I mean, apart from... Actually, I used to do it a bit more before I did TV stuff where they you script everything and then they'd have to check everything and then you kind of get it signed off. So you knew what you were saying. You knew where you were standing. You knew what position you were in for the camera. You knew all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, like, I've, I've never... I don't think I've ever been brave enough to freestyle and also because of the doing the TV stuff, they would never leave it up to chance. But I, I, I would say it's not freestyle. I wouldn't... Uh, ever describe it as that I would say it's responding between the lines it's 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 know your script know where you are and then be able to fly off it and be able to come back because you know where you are so well and I think that's the real in a way that's the hardest bit that's the challenge yeah and yes I've definitely been in that situation where yeah, for sure, in my close-up. Um, you deal again, with real people in the moment, so I think you're yeah. selling yourself a little short if that's what you're saying. Yeah. You it's don't... not like I don't interact. I'm not sort of like behind the screen and just doing the same thing every time. Of course not. Um, and I have, and, and also in TV, I think when you're... I've always found, say, doing hidden camera stuff gives you much more, I don't know, for me, a, a sort of room to, to improv, say you're just having a conversation with somebody as a person. As soon as they see you as a magician, there's a sort of 
in balance. So they're kind of waiting for you to take the reins and do what you need to do. So then you kind of stick to your script more. Whereas if it's conversational, it's, it's easier. Um, I think to do the improv thing. What about those moments when things don't go right now uh, on stage or in close up or you've got a hot Uh, shoe shuffle through it. Yeah. I mean, look, I definitely, I've had, I I remember one time in particular, I mean, complete disaster on stage but you know at the end of the day like I was saying this to some someone the other day you know you're not saving lives you're just sort of you are doing <laughs> so you just your ego gets kind of a bit of a kicking um but I mean you know at the end so of the day what's the disaster tell us I mean without being specific to the tricks or you know be as specific as you want but obviously not uh revelationary perhaps yeah I won't I won't give anything away <laughs> leave out method um okay so the effect is uh when you when somebody gets inside a box somebody else gets on top of the box and then you sort of lift, lift oh wow them. yeah 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 so that's the effect um i was doing this on stage at the south bank um with another magician called james went so james went gets in the box and he takes a camcorder, so this, his image then gets projected on the back of the screen. And he's got a torch in there. So he's like, hi, kids. You know, I'm in the box. And all the kids are like, hi, James. Back at him. I then get on top of the box, <laughs> lift this cloak up. And so we're supposed to switch. And the magic that's supposed to happen didn't happen. And I ended up falling off the box in the kind of heap on the floor with his cloak over me. And poor James is on top of the box. And now I'm and now there's a, a, a video of me being projected on this massive screen of me being like, hi, I'm in the box where I'm, I'm a heap on the floor in front of the stage. I'm supposed to appear in the back of the theatre, so I end up just sort of crawling around the box and hearing the children kind of, parents laughing, kids are confused. I just, I literally just crawl through the back on all fours and then, there's a school bell that I'm supposed to ring as I arrive at the top. So I ring my school bell and there's a kind of slow clap. I mean, it was, it was definitely not a highlight, let me put it like that. But I mean, again, like it was, it, it was quite funny, I suppose. And everyone, I don't know, it's, it's, as I said, the only thing that got uh, uh, hurt was my ego. Is that, is that available, that video? No, thank God. <laughs> I have been asked about it before, but thank God. Nobody in those days were sort of filming everything. Definitely, there would have been many, many videos of that, I'm sure. <laughs> so that is um, a famous uh, effect that the pen dragons used to do, which it, yeah. if you look online and you want to see the, the metamorphosis, uh, the pen dragons were super famous for it. Yeah, um, they were amazingly quick. Amazingly quick, of... amazingly buff as well, both of them. Yeah. Oiled yeah, and no. buff. We, we were definitely not dressed like that at all. There was no leotard. <laughs> <time. laughs> Not even for James. You should put James in a leotard. No, I, but I, you know, I've always thought it'd be quite fun to sort of do that role reversal, even if it is slightly cliche, but kind of getting a, a guy in some spandex and making him a glamorous assistant. I thought it'd be quite fun, but it's never really, you know, it's never been something I've sort of uh, built on, but it'd be quite fun, I think. So the next big show that you did was um, Help My Supply Teacher uh, yeah. is a magician. Is that how it how my supply teacher is magic. Is magic. Yeah. Explain yeah. the premise of this. Okay, so this was um, a hidden camera magic show uh, that was uh, based in different schools around uh, London, generally. And the children would be in a classroom, and there would be hidden cameras everywhere, and you would go in as a supply teacher for a day. So it would be like, hello, class, you're genuine teacher, whoever can't be here, and I'm misdirection or some sort of, you know, equally as cheesy name as that. <laughs> and then you'd, you know, teach them a lesson, let's say, about gravity, and then you'd make uh, things start floating around the classroom and make crazy things happen. Right. Uh, so as a concept, it was amazing. It was a really fun um, and successful show. Right. But what well, that sounds like a butt there. No. 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 Okay. It was, it was, I thought you were going to go, but the you, no, you, you did uh, quite a few seasons of it. Yeah. No. There was no buts in it. It was great, and it was 
it was fun and it taught me so much and it was we all got on so well you had a great um, team as well a great team um and a lovely team as well like it was very sort of nurturing um i had anthony owen uh, who sort of was heading that and we had anthony waldron another magician who was, they kind of really looked after, particularly me, James and Fergus, who'd never done anything like that before. And right. um, John Archer was obviously kind of massively experienced. But, uh, yeah, it was it was so fun. I mean, if you can imagine, we'd be, everyone would be in a classroom next door if it wasn't your turn to be up performing. And you'd have the cameramen kind of zooming in on the children's faces as things would be floating around the classroom and books would be flying across the room and the children were just kind of, it was, it was hilarious. It was really like good, fun, yeah, family fun. It was great. Was that a BBC show? Yeah, it was a BBC show. And then, and as the kind of the series progressed, we then had to start wearing disguises and stuff. So um, the second series, I think I'm, if I remember rightly, I'm mostly in like this strange red wig. <laughs> thing because the children started sort of being like oh you know that's James or that's Fergus um and then and then afterwards then we sort of played different characters in each we, we did we did how my my school trip is magic and <clears throat> and then from there then we'd play you know some American or an Australian or we'd get dressed up as characters which again was, it was really fun and it was and the fact it was undercover I loved that Again, it gives you that whole kind of you can just play around and you can get children to ask questions and just play with that. So it was really fun. Well, there you go. I mean, that's you improvising immediately. Yeah. I mean, there's no, way, there's no way you can stay on the script. No, you can't stay on the script. But I actually, I loved that. There were so many nice things about that. The fact you're sort of playing a character, the fact that you know the children at home are kind of feeling in on the joke with you. Um, so that's a really nice dimension as opposed to sort of just being you know, the big magician and amazing everybody. Um, yeah. There was a sort of us whispering into the camera saying the children are coming in now. So there was this kind of, you know, you're conspiring with all the, the audience at home. So it was really nice in that way. And what, how long did that go? Three seasons? Yeah, that did three seasons. Um, and yeah, it was successful. It won a BAFTA, I think, was it the second season for being the best entertainment, children's entertainment show on TV? Um, yeah, it was, it was a great show, and I think they sold it to quite a few different countries. There's, that was sort of circulating, but with us, with dubbed voices and stuff. Oh, really? It wasn't? They didn't re- yeah. reshoot it for each country? Um, I mean, maybe, maybe they did in, in, in some places, I don't know, but I know that our voices got dubbed as well. So, I mean, a lot of people, it's, it's interesting as well. And it may have changed now with social media and that sort of thing, but people used to think the holy grail of performance or success was being on TV. So you went on TV, that was it, that changed everything. Suddenly you're a millionaire, all doors are open, you cracked it, you bought your house. It wasn't that, was it? Yeah, it's it's so far from that. I mean, I won't go into what I got paid, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's so not like that. It's peanuts, particularly when you're doing a show like that in a children's show. But no one, I, I don't think anybody goes into TV for the money itself. It's more like the best marketing you can imagine for then you sort of justifying you know, making the big bucks. So you can then put out a price and say, oh, I'm worth this much because I've been on TV. But you don't make the money from TV itself. Did it open doors? Because I remember that, that Darren Brown story where he said um, he he did his first uh, mind reading show on, on channel four and he'd been like a close up magician up to that point And the first shows had gone out and I think he spoke to his manager, his agent, and they were putting him out for, you know, exorbitant amounts. And suddenly he'd get maybe one gig, but he couldn't do the, the 300 quid gigs anymore because he was too high profile. And suddenly basically he's not earning any money because it hasn't all kicked in yet. Did oh, you... what, so did, did, did I find that? Yeah. Or... No, absolutely not. No, I never got to that kind of level of um, demanding that much money. I mean, I, certainly I could demand more money, but I never got into a situation where I was like, just waiting for a massive job. And, I've, and I w- I'm always prepared to kind of do a mixture anyway. Um, just your bottom rate kind of gets 
pushed up, but it's not like I would, and I, and I never suddenly kind of, particularly with supply teacher, I never made, made a massive impact. Mind games more so, but not, not supply teacher. So, okay. So is mind games, the, was that the next show that you did after supply teacher? Yes, yeah, so then Mind Games was um, the next show, which was my uh, my own show. So that was a m- massive change for me, and it was all mentalism. And at that point, I did some mentalism, but I definitely didn't classify myself as a mentalist. So it was more like they were sort of building a product and an idea of a product from from the outside, and then sort of trying, you know, get me to step into that. What do you um, what do you think of uh, of, of mentalism? Because it's it's this interesting thing. Because I'm always of the 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 idea that that they're really the same, but it's about framing and what terms ma- it, like ma- ma- magic and and mind reading or mentalism. And and it, this is controversial because I remember when I started with the with the mind reading stuff. I remember being on like the magic cafe and I mm-hmm. and some very well-known mentalists were like, no, you can't do a magic trick. If you're a mentalist, you can't do a card trick. I was like, bollocks, you can. And yeah. um, I know some no, fab people who do, who manage to incorporate both very well, but it's about your, you and your character. Yeah, I mean, I think magic and mentalism are both, they're, they're both different in my eyes. Like, you know, when I... And the major difference for me is, is that when you're a mentalist, you're generally you're relying on the, the narrative, the theatre. It's your words. You can't sort of, you know, chuck a coin in a bottle and not say anything and walk off. That doesn't cut it. You've got to you've got to you've got to dress the whole thing. So in some ways, I mean, this might sound I don't know what it sounds like. It might sound bad, but in some ways, I think you've got to be. A, better performer to be a mentalist than you do have to be to be a magician you can kind of get away with visual stuff and and you can have gravitas by not saying anything you can't have gravitas by being a silent mentalist that doesn't really work the only thing you can do is kind of make your reveals interesting but you can't rely on a reveal the reveal itself isn't a magical effect it's it's just it's a way of displaying something but it's not like you're doing something physically impossible, right. which is a different thing with magic, obviously. But, the, I mean, there are magic tricks that you can bring into the mentalist canon, in a way, and reframe them. That's true. Yeah, you can. And even, you know, my uh, mentalist uh, stage show, I do a, a T-shirt change in it, which is a magic trick, but I do a prediction on it. So mm-hmm. you kind of get a, yeah, a, a double thing going on. Um but yeah, I, mean, I think it's a really blurry line. I think for people to sort of be possessive over one area of magic in general is kind of a little bit odd. I think that's the really interesting thing, actually. And I think that brings on a, an interesting debate or discussion in the imitation game in magic or the idea that you've got to be, because everyone's doing this thing, that's the thing you should be doing. Now, in a way, you've kind of, you've challenged that in, in yourself because you pushed yourself beyond the expectation or what other people have done before. You've come forward and you've done different stuff and mm-hmm. you've, you keep challenging it and putting yourself in an in a uncomfortable position. You know, that's, yeah. that's really important. I think that's really important for creativity to, to force yourself into that that position where you you're not really a hundred percent confident because yes you've got to know what you're doing of course but there's that edge and there's that development like you get better yeah I mean definitely like you know the kind of the difference between say me doing supply teacher one and then to three I mean I incomparable like the the discomfort that you feel the massive discomfort there's always that kind of elation afterwards it was like I remember I don't know if you saw this but the first time I ever did live tv I mean I was I genuinely thought I was going to be sick before I went on I in fact I was sick I just managed to kind of like swallow it down again this was in the room about to go on I think it was uh what was it, it was a good morning 
not good morning Britain, daybreak, that's it. So it's one before. It was really early. I had to go there at like four o'clock in the morning. Um, and I was just like, again, you kind of had that out of body experience. Like at that point, I'd never done any TV. So it was the first thing I'd ever done. It was going live. And it was just this kind of, yeah, I mean, it was, but it was amazing. And afterwards I felt so kind of pumped. Just I'd never felt that kind of elation before. But you get that, you know, the more you push yourself and the more you're kind of, you jump off the edge of the cliff, then afterwards you kind of reap the rewards of it, I guess. You studied psychology? Yeah. So the way people think or feel or how would you describe what, what it is you were? Um, I mean, I would say with the psychology, I did psychology at uni um, with with social sciences. Um, that's a kind of the umbrella of it all. But um yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to do anything with psychology. It was just kind of one of those degrees I thought I'll do something because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then obviously I decided to be a magician. And then later it kind of, it was the kind of perfect backdrop and then enabled me to write, you know, narratives in relation to the mentalism and feel like I have some authority within that because I'd done psychology and you could kind of refer to things and I think, uh, in terms of the performance, you could drop things in and, and make it sound very convincing, and 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 you can genu- genuinely use things that have gone on in psychology as well, which is really nice. So you 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 have an understanding then about perhaps a, a little bit more about the way people tick. It's not just learnt from the experience, <laughs> you know, on the road. You've you've got a, a more intellectual understanding of it would you say is that um, I mean actually, honestly I don't know if I would say that I mean yes I've got a background um in psychology and there are things and I'm interested in human behavior in general but in terms of what you know what a mentalist does I don't know how much of that you can really bring into uh, getting the results you want with somebody on stage. I think it will help. I mean, I guess it's like training in anything. It's like if you're training to be an actor, you don't realise all of the years and years of training, you kind of forget it, but then that just builds up your arm and then to step out and do the job. So, yes, I'm sure it does help, but I don't think I've got sort of a special insight into into people. Um, there, there was this really interesting um, podcast uh, I was watching the other day with... Um, it was a Joe Rogan one with this... Um, uh, what is a professor of neurology and his name was Andrew Huberman and he was talking about dopamine release in the brain and this and what it does and that 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 elation you got me thinking about it with that you know that pure elation that excitement that you felt after the challenge of the interview that you went through you know and that release of and then it becomes that addiction for the release as a performer. You want to feel that the applause, the the interaction, the, the, the you know the audience. Mm-hmm. And uh, he talked about hypnosis as a an actual, um, in a sense, a third state from sleep and uh, awakeness. And it, that was in- interesting. I think it's quite interesting for magicians to think about that, or, or mentalists to think about what. Mm-hmm what these things are and I think that the, the, the thing that they talked about that, that I thought was really interesting is the way that children's brains are really open and susceptible and one of the ways that they learn really well is through play through playing mm-hmm. and they now think that there's a neuroplasticity in the brain even as adults that we can change the wiring we can change how we think we can move different concepts and, and 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 adapt whereas the previous thinking was like it's it's solid state at one point and that's it and i think yeah. that's really interesting um and i think this idea of play is super super interesting because that's what we do and i think at its best it's that childlike playfulness that taps into the audience and I think that's fascinating, and 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 that's where these connections—the idea of the psychology that you've 
studied, the experience that you had working with kids, doing it for adults. I mean, so you go into um, what's the, the 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 mind reading show called? Uh, mind games. Mind games, which is very different from supply teacher. Yeah, and a different no, audience. Yeah, it's hugely different. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I know that. Um, Steve Jobs did a whole talk on um, sort of connecting the dots and the idea that, you know, everything helps. And absolutely, like, my psychology studies, of course, would have helped. And, there's a, and yes, there is an understanding about human behaviour and um, certainly certain genres of human behaviour and types of people and things like that. Um, but I also think, uh, you know, interestingly, when I, when I, the first thing I did when I left university and I don't even know why I came up with this idea, but I wanted to do something that really scared me. So I obviously quite liked pushing myself. So I decided to go and train with Shaolin monks um, in northern China. And so we were, you know, I went with a friend of mine, and we stayed there, I think, for six weeks. And I remember hearing about this and thought that I can't imagine doing anything more. Like, in, in that time in my life, I couldn't think of anything more sort of uh, daunting to do. So anyway, we, we went off there and did it. And it was, it was an amazing experience. And it was partly me trying to push myself. I wanted to push myself. So, um, and I certainly, at the beginning of my career, I was very much like that. I kept wanting to push, 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 push. And doing that in China definitely sort of, again, it gives you that little bit of confidence just to keep putting yourself in these uncomfortable situations and think, that sounds scary, I'll do it, and I'll just keep pushing and then see where that gets me. And, um, and I guess as much as you might, you know, for me, I might think, oh, I, I don't like the fear, but actually I do, I do like being on, in the wings before I'm going on stage, even though it is terrifying. There's something incredibly exhilarating about it. Yeah, I, I don't think there's, there, are, is, there are other feelings like it, obviously, but... It's such a unique, you feel so alive from it. And then when you go on, I mean, it's like you're on a complete emotional roller coaster. Um, and it's fun. And you kind, of, you kind of have to use a bit of self-hypnosis, I think, to convince yourself you're, you know, you're, you're having a great time, even though you might be terrified. But it's a kind of, it's, it's exciting and you feel very uh, alive. So you can't just say, I, I went and studied with Shaolin monks and leave it at that. What, what happened? Um, how long was it? How, how long was it, did you say? Yeah. Um, so we were there for six weeks. Um, that's significant. That's not, I just, you know, that's like, you could have been Batman by the end of it. Yeah, I, I tell you what, the only thing that you realise is just how, what a puny little geeky, you know, sort of weakling I was. I definitely was not able to um, fight anybody. And in fact, interestingly, so when you go there, by the time you end, you can have a fight with somebody. Okay, so hang on, hang on, hang on. So you've gone to China. I'm going to go yeah. and train with Shaolin monks. What does that mean? So you basically, so we went to an academy, and um, well, I, I sort of tell you, okay, I'm going to tell you what happened when I first arrived. So I arrived at this academy. It was in northern China, which is kind of in the mountains. And I remember turning up, and I could hear for the first time men screaming. Now, this is a noise I'd never heard before. So I was like, what is going on? I said to my mind, I'm like, I'm scared. Like, what's, what's going on? And what they were doing, we found out afterwards, was they were doing something called power stretching, which is basically where they sort of get you in kind of like a crucifix position. So you imagine you're all sort of like that, and then you've got people pinning you down and then stretching parts of your body. So they might... They do one where they'll try and get you to do the box split, so they'll kind of open your legs like that. And then your shifu, which is your master, stands and bounces and kind of to stretch you out so then you can do these high, high kicks. So that was like kind of my first, when I first arrived. And then, and the actual like days, what it looked like, we, we'd end up getting up at maybe I think it was five in the morning and we'd do qigong and then you'd do sanda, which was like kind of, it was all like forms and patterns, basically. Um... And then we do a bit of uh, sort of kickboxing type thing, um, and we keep, <laughs> this sounds sort of so basic, but it was a basic place to be fair. And then we'd run around this um, uh, the courtyard, just running around and around and around, for sort of maybe half an hour. 
Um, and so we had all these sort of different things we'd do each day, and then by the end of it, then you'd, you know, they'd get you to fight with somebody. But I, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. Um, and after three months, you get a whip weapon of choice. So then you choose your staff or a whip or a sword. But I wasn't there for three months, so I didn't get that. But yeah. And what you were in, you were like boarding there. It was kind of was it like yeah. a meditative experience or was it? Yeah, the, the qigong was like a moving meditation. So we did that for two hours a day, so an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. Um, but it, it mostly it was it was like you know we do like there was a praying mantis type of fighting, and we do kung fu. We did you know we did uh, it was it was a fighting school. It wasn't a sort of meditative retreat. And so, what were you in a kind of uh, dorm or separate yeah. rooms, or were you cut off from reality, or did you go out in the town, or was it kind of like this intense? There wasn't really a town to go to. There was a place down the road called Meat on Stick. We were like, what's Meat on Stick? And it was literally like they just find like a cockroach and then cook it on a barbecue. So we used to go down there, which was just—I mean, it really wasn't a town. It was just sort of. That was actually like a few benches and a bonfire next to a kind of a dump. Um, and in, in terms of where we uh, lived, it was just really basic. So I slept in a kind of dorm with my friend, and then in the morning, your shifu, so um, shifu Wong, which was our master there, would come and check your room. So it was kind of like a, I guess, like an army school or something. It was, it was really uh, different than I, anything I'd ever done before, and it was. Um, quite an experience but to be fair I was quite looking forward to leave I was up for leaving by the time by the time the six weeks were up it was quite an intense period of time so did you do you feel you carried that with you at all that whole experience uh, I mean I certainly did afterwards I mean not now no I mean I, I barely ever think about it now but um at the time it was one of those things that I thought I'm really scared to do that and so the fact that I did it kind of yeah, I, I guess I felt quite proud of myself, the fact I'd done it. So then we move into, so let's let's uh, step back into mind games. Yeah. How was that pitched to you? How did that come about? Um, so interestingly, so I wrote a uh, pitch idea with Max, which was called uh, Bionic Cupid, which was this idea that was, based on that pickup artistry book the game and it was supposed to be a spin-off of that so it's like a kind of retaliation I suppose to this whole game that men were playing and women it's like how do you play the game back to men and get men to do what, what you want and kind of make them eat out of the palm of your hand that was like the general premise of the show um so anyway we wrote this like pitch idea by a cupid which then Matt Crook saw and then he sort of changed it all up and they just they basically wanted a sort of female Darren Brown. That was that was the idea, um, and yeah, and so that's how it all came about. So I remember, um, I think it was a a couple of times I I came on set, so to speak, with you. Yeah. There was one time in the bookshop in Charing Cross. Was that the teaser, or was that what yeah. the show? That was that was um, that was for the. Uh, trailer, not the trailer, sorry, the pilot. Okay, I think I was there for moral support more than anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what, I remember when that was being shot, we didn't have enough time left, and so the way they sort of negotiated it with the library, so basically, as you know, it was it was me uh, predicting a book, I think, in the entire bookshop. I think it was the words, the book, someone thought of you met someone in a restaurant and then you said, I'm going to, I don't know if they were, I can't remember. You met them and they said, can we do something? And then they said, yeah. And then you took them to Charing Cross. It was like foils or it was one of the big bookshops, yeah. Waterstones. It was one of those huge bookshops. And I remember the way that they sort of negotiated to get this location was that you had a certain amount of time. So they were like panic stricken. It was like, Lights are going to turn off in 15 minutes. Like we need to get the shot. And this is at like 12 o'clock at night or whatever, whenever. I think it must have been 12 o'clock when the day ends. And everyone is panic stricken and we can't get the shot. So then all the lights turn off. We're like, we don't have the shot. And then all the guys have to try and get lights. And so we went into this little corner and like set up this um, 
yeah, I'm trying to set up to try and make it look like the same light. I mean, it was it was all felt, particularly from I have to say, particularly from doing supply teacher, where we used to have like a week to rehearse, and then Anthony would come in and we'd be working on things for a whole week, and then he'd come in and give us notes. Then we might go away, and we'd work for another week. It was just completely different. It was like actually learning a stage show, whereas this was like you. I would get told on the day sometimes what I was doing, and it was. Yeah, it felt like much more sort of by the seat of my pants. So um, that got, from that, got picked up for a season. Yes, well, for Mind Games. For Mind Games. Yeah. And then yeah. I remember, and, and again, <laughs> tough on budget. Um, you, definitely under stress to get the thing done as cheaply I suppose and as efficiently with those constraints as possible and I came and saw you in a very cold warehouse in East London somewhere I remember it was freezing and you were having your hair done and you were a bit panicked I remember that point it was like yeah. Well, I, so yeah I came to see you to get uh, some like performance Sort of coaching and advice and stuff before uh, filming started, and yeah, and it was well, it was always very rushed. That's how it kind of and I and I think a lot of TV is. I mean, obviously now the whole kind of shape of TV has changed so much um, over the past ten years. But it's like I remember just feeling that like it was everything was hurried, hurried, hurried. So even the, the makeup artist who I had, who was a friend of mine who usually worked on film, she was like, this is just so different. So I always felt like, you know, you're just, again, it's like you're being told what to say then and there, and then you say it. And the difficult thing for that, for, and I think for anyone in that situation, is you, obviously, all of that stuff is going out there forever. So you would think you'd try and put more hours into that than anything else. But the reality is, is that because it's all about, you know, money and budgets and time, you just don't get, as much opportunity and so there's i mean and there is this delicate balance because at the end of the day it's you up there so it it it, it succeeds or falls ultimately with you as the face of it whether mm. that's down to you or not so yeah, that's, definitely. that's a tough thing it's a really tough thing and i remember saying to you the other day like i could really see how people i mean turn into a diva a diva's got such a bad connotation but how you have to stand your ground, how you have to kind of demand certain things to enable you to do your best. Because at the end of the day, it's all on your shoulders anyway. So you, you just have to be strong in that and know what you need and not kind of deviate from that. And again, I think I learned that quite late on. Um, and sometimes you only feel like you're in a position to do that when you're comfortable that you 100% you're going to be able to deliver and all of that stuff. But nowadays, I think if I was to do another TV show, I'd be in a very different uh, frame of mind to do it. Yeah, you're, you're kind of, you're dealing with this sensibility of, uh, you know, oh my God, I've got this job. <laughs> Am I going to be fired? Or they're going to keep me? You know, if I say something, if I question it, am I being a diva? Or am I being, am I being, is it fair? And mm -hmm. that's where I think, you know, that th I suppose the unionised idea of equity which doesn't really have much power now in the UK, but certainly in the US with SAG, which is the Screen Actors Guild, they certainly, if you're doing a SAG contract, they certainly have certain powers that say, you know, you, the person can only work this way, these things have to happen, there's certain considerations. And I think certainly in England and certainly with the TV game, it was like, we don't care, <laughs> you just do, do what we tell you, it is yeah. this, take it or leave it. Yeah, and I think as well, you know, for me, creatively, I never really had much of a voice. So particularly for Mind Games, it was, you know, essentially it was a, a bunch of guys in a room deciding what this show should look like, deciding what I should look like, deciding what I should say. And then me kind of coming in and being like, okay, so what am I supposed to be doing? And so I think for anyone in that situation, if you don't have any sort of creative control about what you're doing and you never feel like you truly own it mm -hmm. because you don't own it you sort of feel like you're being puppeteered and you're not invested in it or connected to it in the right way and that's not 
deliberate. I think that's probably just a byproduct of that situation. Um, whereas when I did, for example, the uh, um, what's it called? Magi- uh, Next Great Magician. Which was on ITV, was Finding was the on- Next Great Magician was the premise. Yeah. Um, and although they said, this is what we want you to do, I remember feeling like I, I was much more kind of like, I'm not doing that, by the way, like that. I'm going to do it this way or that. And it gave me just more control to then do what I wanted to do, which is, uh, I think, for any person performing or doing something creative, it's it's really important because otherwise, why are you there? Do you think, was the Mind Games ultimately a good experience? Would you have liked it to have been different or... Um, or continued was it did you expect a continuation or how did you um, feel I mean do you know what I think it wasn't a great experience for me um but that's nothing to do with the crew or anything like that I think that was probably just where I was at in my life um but interestingly I saw uh, one of the camera guys there at Anthony's uh uh, you know, like Memorial. Drinks, Memorial drinks had, yeah. So that was Anthony Owen who passed away, unfortunately. He was yeah. um, the head of, was he the head of Objective Productions? or the head of Magic and Objective, yeah. yeah. So I worked with him a lot, um, in, yeah, certainly in the early days. Um, but interestingly, so at his memorial, I saw a camera guy who'd worked on um, Mind Games, and he said, I just wanted to tell you it was the funniest show I'd ever worked on. And I thought, how interesting, you know, like my experience of it was, it wasn't that it... it No, it wasn't fun. To be honest, it wasn't a fun experience. You're kind of like trying to hold so much together. Um, But I learned so much and I really valued the team I was with. And I had amazing writers. I had, um, sorry, Ian Sharkey and Stephen Long um, Mm -hmm. working with me. And it was brilliant. I mean, I had all of Darren's team basically um, working with me. So, yeah, it was it was amazing. But um, do you think you were, do you think you're running to the beat of someone else's drum a little bit, even in, even creatively? Oh, massively, yeah, massively. And also um, the people you, you you know the people you've previously worked with, it's a different experience. And you're, I think maybe uh, you know, not to put words in your mouth, um, but thinking about your own creative te- team. You know, you're sh- mm-hmm. you, you know people who you work with, uh, you have a shorthand to. You have people you call up when you have a problem now as an mm-hmm. experienced performer and you go directly to the source and you know there are certain people who you're going to call first. Yeah. End yeah, of story, definitely. you know. And I think as well, I guess that comes with time. I mean, if you can sort of piece together your team and have the people in the wings that you want, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a necessity. I think... Anybody that's going to be performing big shows and and doing a lot creatively and and have big demands on them, then they need an amazing team around them. You can't. You, I don't think you can deliver that without it. And that's a. Re- I think that's a really interesting thing as a magician. And a lot of magicians who start in the game, it's very attractive because you can go and do close up magic and you can be you at a gig and you show someone a magic trick and they're like, you're the best magician I've ever seen. And they've never seen another magician. And, uh, you know, it's there, there's that. And, and as you go further down the line, it's not that anymore. And suddenly you realize it's not me because mm-hmm. actually I need a team. The idea that you are this solo performer, you ain't no solo performer. There's a whole team of people behind you. Even, I would say now, even as a close-up performer in a lot of ways, you know, you have your, yes, your experience, you know what you're doing now. And, and, but, but even yeah. to, to, to adapt and to develop, you're like, hey, Paul, hey, Max, hey, Neb, hey, uh, hey, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, yeah, definitely you have that sort of team of people that you fall on. I mean, that's, it's a mixture. You, you, as a performer, as a magician, you're always by yourself, ultimately, like, if you're, you're driving up the M4 and go into that job by yourself and then you're doing it by yourself. But that's why I think the magic community is so important and there's a real support there for people. Um, and it's a, it's a quite, it's a quite a close knit little world and everybody, I think my experience is everyone pulls together and there's a kind of uh, a great support network and people share ideas and, and, and you need that. Like, I, you know, I absolutely could not have done it 
any of the things I've done without the people um, to help me and guide me and advise me and, you know, bump me up when I need it and all of that stuff. So you've done a wide range of mediums as well. So you've done the close-up circuit, you've done TV, very different different types of show, very different types of show in the magic field, but, you know, quite diverse and, and unlike each other. And... Um, and also stage. You did stage magic as well. Mm-hmm. And ha- yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I would say, interestingly, I've probably done more stage now since the TV. And I, I hadn't done a huge amount of stage when I was doing the TV stuff. And since then, I kind of built up more of a stage show and I get hired out more for corporates in that way. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very different type of performance. You can't compare it. Like, I didn't even think I necessarily wanted to be on stage when I first started. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, again, you just, I think you just need to be so much more polished to do it on stage. You know, with a close up, you can, you're doing the same trick, same, you know, five, six tricks, you know, over and over and over again in the night. And if one doesn't work, you think that's okay. I can just, it's only five people and you can do something else. If you're on stage, again, it's just you just need to have that polished uh, performance. Sound like the police were coming in there just to... Yeah, like, yeah don't worry. <laughs> um, and, don't worry. and you've done theatre... Well, I saw you at the um, West End Theatre. Yeah. That, that was another experience. That was an experience, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't stay on that very long, so I left that quite quickly um so which they sort of gave me a choice to say you know you can stay and what this do... was the what was this if you're happy this to talk about it. yeah hmm? this was the imp- it wasn't it, it, yeah well it was impossible and it, and it was called impossible right so, okay yeah. yeah and you, you you had a choice to stay or, or to leave was that good bad indifferent is that um Okay, so this is this is a perfect example, if I'm being honest, of me having opportunities put on my lap because I'm a rarity in the industry. Um, and th- that was another Anthony Owen thing. So he kind of opened the door for me on that. And I was, and, I, and I've always felt sort of obligated to be like, yes, 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 any opportunity that comes my way, which again, I think I'm, I'm trying to change that about myself. So I just think it's important that you do things that you want to do. Now, ultimately, I'd never had a huge desire to be in a stage show like that. Um, but plus, more importantly, I hadn't done a lot of stage at that point, so I didn't really have an act that was suitable. So this I is was a, having... sorry. This is a, a, a stage show in the West End, multiple magicians in, in the vein yeah. of the Illusionist, and this is called Impossible. Yeah, exactly. So it was. Uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly how many magicians were in there, but we all had a sort of a slot to fill um and the magicians in this show would have been doing they some of them toured um most of them done this act that they were performing in this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of time it was something they've been doing for years and then you can just literally pick them up put them on stage and then they can do the show um but because i'm unique in the industry they were they're essentially building a band i guess it's a magician band so they want this one and that one and they want to kind of make it look right um, so I got given the opportunity. Now I remember thinking, what, you know, what am, what am I going to do? And I remember speaking to Anthony about it. He said, it's fine, you know, we've come up with something for you. But I was coming up with something a week before, supposed to be, you know, on a West End stage in front of 900 people. I mean, it was just like, I mean, it was, it was kind of madness in a way. So I, I did do, I did a few nights of that, which... You know, but I just think the act wasn't strong enough, to be honest. But, I mean, you know, I'd only been doing it a week. And you can't do that. You can't just wing it on the West End stage. <laughs> it doesn't really doesn't really work. So I could have stayed. I could have done stuff. Um, they were doing stuff in the audience and filming people um, and filming magicians performing in the audience. Um, but... I decided, I, I just decided I'd, I'd leave. I didn't, I thought, I'm not, I'm, I'm not massively enjoying it. And even if I do that side of it, which is fun, and I could have done that, and, you know, that would have been absolutely fine. I just thought it was, yeah, it was better for me if, that, I, that I left. 
and I was happy. And I knew that the fact that I, when I left, I was happy. I thought I'd made the right decision. No, you, I, I remember. I, but I remember working on one of the tricks with you that you developed, which was a gambling routine. And it was about, do you remember that one? It was about, like, was it my, I was, when I was young, I used to watch all these gamblers, my dad, and I'd come in the yeah, room. Some sort of, like, sexy sort of gambling woman like a bit like a kind of not a bonnie from bonnie and clyde but that kind of thing like a woman that would what scam was that, you. that film with the um the woman who ran the poker games the illicit poker games with the film stars it had that kind of feel to it you were running the game but yeah, you were a magician I mean, it was great great it's, premise it's a great premise and i totally get it like of course and then they wanted me to pick the guy's pocket at the end amazing like but that act you you need you know, I would say at least a year, like working in something like that, the character, the, yeah. you know, what we're doing, if we're pickpocketing someone, it's like, you need the whole, you need a, a lot of practice in it. And, and yeah, and again, it's that whole thing of people can come up with a concept and be like, that sells, but then you need to be able to deliver, as I said, and in that case, you know, I, I, I couldn't deliver for the week's time. Did you feel a bit hung out to dry or did you feel that? No, actually, I felt I, I felt quite excited to to leave. It was I almost right. felt obliged to do it when I never really wanted to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just you no. Know, I mean, I didn't at all. I was I was I was happy to leave, and I thought, great. I, and I went on holiday. I was happy. <laughs> so, um, ne- where are we now in in your magic career? Mm. what what's what are you thinking now um well you know I've, there are opportunities are you still uh, inspired are you still inspired by magic is this something I would, you know like i think i've probably spoken to you about this before it sort of goes in peaks and troughs so i have i i've definitely went through a lull and i think i'm beginning to get more inspired again um and the things i would be interested in doing with magic ultimately i think have probably uh, d- different to the things I've done um, and you know I, I, I put together this sort of rig that makes things look like time stopping and I wanted to look at concepts like time and and then moving time on stage and things like that so I think I am inspired but I think it's just about being specific about what I want to do and and staying true to that and then and then and then ultimately feeling proud about it because I think you know, not that I am proud of the things I've done, but it's just feeling like you're always sort of, uh, yeah, what's the expression? Uh, the beat of someone else's drum. Right. What's the, De- yeah. Developing, beating, yeah. You you, you want to be in control. Yeah. Um, you want to be developing your own act and, and, and working the way that you want to work, I think, ultimately. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I, and I do get inspired. I do definitely get inspired by... Uh, seeing other performers. Um, I know I've, I think I've spoken to you about Rob Zabrecki before, but just saying, you know, I think he's he's great. He's very kind of just, when I watched him, I was inspired by him. I thought he's such an all well-rounded kind of thorough performer in the way that he delivers something. There's no cracks. You can't see But I, I would say that's like his act, which I think we probably saw at, we definitely saw at one of the international conventions it may not have been the first one we went to, but it was definitely one I think we were both yeah. at. In fact, we were both at, I remember. And um, he does this wonderful character. I mean, it's it's all about character, though. I mean, the magic, yeah. the magic is good, but with him, it's about character and narrative. Yeah, that is true. But I also, and I think I mentioned to you the other day as well about this, but that I saw Fergus, who I worked on, a supply teacher with he did a show which was nothing about character it was completely a sort of him just revealing his sort of inner fears and you know secrets he'd had and it was all about him like mm-hmm. a real genuine show about him um again the magic was kind of very secondary to his story um but i mean i was massively inspired by that and i think particularly because i know him and then you sort of see a transition and how it, he's kind of uh, done something amazing and again I came away from that really inspired and 
what and that's why I'm working with Neb now. I know as well that you you're one of these people who I think does the right thing in the sense that it's not when we say it's not just about the magic. Of course, magic has to be good. That's like that's a baseline. The magic's got to be good, of course. But you are influenced by art, by music, by culture, by other things. And so it's those things, I think, that you bring into your work that, hi- that, that heighten and lift your show. No, definitely. I mean, I, I saw an amazing uh, show actually during lockdown, um, which was his name. It was... Simon McBurney, I think. And it Simon was McBurney, do... Theatre Theatre de Complicité. Did you see it? I didn't see it, but I'll you carry on and we'll. Uh... Okay, so it, it was brilliant, and I I remember hearing about uh, the encounter, which was what the book was called, um, years and years ago, and a girl recommended it to me, and she said she'd seen the show, and everyone was kind of completely blown away by it. Um, and again, like I, I watched that show and I was completely inspired. And from that, watching that show in lockdown, I kind of came up with a whole magic show idea, the premise of it, from seeing that show. Um, and, and yeah, so I mean, I could definitely get inspired and it, it, was, it was brilliant and I would massively recommend it to anyone. Did you watch that online? Yeah, so he did a, he, I think they had a, it was on for a week. Yeah, and I missed it. And I was telling people to watch it, funny enough. And, and did you, so you haven't seen it yourself? No, but it's really funny that you bring that up, you see, because at drama school, one of, uh, in fact, I, I interview um, one of my, well, he was, he was a teacher and director of mine, uh, Mark Bowden, and he became, he's now a behavioral expert, and he looks at body language, and he's a really, uh, if you haven't heard that podcast, when this comes out, go back and listen to that because he's fascinating and one of the first things or plays that I went and saw when I was at drama school was um, Street of Crocodiles which was a theatre to complicite show and it was all movement based and creating characters and it was kind of you know you, it, it almost describes as like really pretentious and rubbishy but actually it's it's more it's, it's, it's spiritual it's uplifting it's, it's very hard to describe but the I think I, Street of Crocodiles may have been to do with Holocaust or Survivors, and there were these characters, and I remember someone chasing someone through the forest, and there was no scenery. It was just the actors became trees, and yeah. then someone moved past the trees, and then they became children, and then they had the, the old-style desks with the lift-up lids, and they used that, and then there was this, there was this moment at the end where someone was passed... It was the most, it made, literally made you cry. They, they were in a line and the, the character, I think, was a child or something and they lifted this ch- person up. It was an adult playing the child. It was a company of, I don't know, 12, 15, whatever it was. And they passed this person from person to person, like caring, lovingly. And it was just, you just wept. Well, yeah. that's theatre, that's yeah. the intensity of theatre, and it you know it's fine seeing online. Of course, we we have to, and that's fine. But it's nothing like theatre live, like being in the room. And there's that shared experience, that that energy, that emotion that's shared, that reinvention of the thing every night. But I think theatre to complicity, and they did out of the house, walked a man was another one I saw. I can't remember all the ones. I still have the program to Street of Crocodiles, actually. And wow. So I know exactly what you mean. If you take that into magic, you're creating... It's no longer magic. It's a piece of theatre that has magic. Exactly. And that's kind of where I would like to go with things. Along with... I've I've always loved the idea of doing sort of moving art installation pieces. I can't remember what the artist is called now. It might come back to me, but he basically did a, a collection of, of art and installation, which was sculpture with air. So he'd sculpt objects and things just using air, which is actually where I got uh, the idea for, for my floating papers on my website. 
because he sort of did some things like that, but in particular, he did this most beautiful thing with silk, which is it's really simple. I think I don't know if I ever showed it to you, but it's two pieces of silk just being sort of blown around, and it looks so magical, um, and it's just stunning, and it's kind of bringing in that element which I don't see much of in magic, that kind of ethereal, real beauty in magic and trying to sort of make that into an installation in some way and and into a world and, and that's what I'd like to do with the whole the, the time and uh, yeah what I was mentioning before I think that's really interesting in this it, just bringing us on perhaps finally to the idea of where magic is now and what's going on and this idea of the social media experience and people basically copying everybody um, because they see something that works in something and they go, right, that's, that's the only way to do it. So-and-so was, was good on um, Britain's Got Talent. I've got it. That's the only way to be successful is to go Britain's Got Talent. Or so-and-so is a big social media star. That's the only way to be successful is to be a social media star just like them and do exactly what they do. And I think, I certainly think that that's not the way I mean, it's certainly worth looking at, but I think what's actually, in a way, is kind of what you've done. You know, you've not done, you've not trod, trodden the path that others have trodden. You've kind of opened it up more. Um, maybe. I mean, it's nice of you to say that. I think, I think I've been lucky enough to get opportunities that have allowed me to sort of do things that maybe other people, other people will be perfectly capable more capable than me to do it's just you know I've just been lucky enough to be in that situation um but I definitely in terms of where I'd like to take things creatively I'd like to go in I'd like to do things I think yeah differently and, and even in mentalism as well like I I felt that the world of mentalism like if you see our kind of era at the moment being very material as we're in a materialist era that Darren, who of course is phenomenal, but it's mentalism is framed as uh, you know logic, rationalists, um, everything that's physical, the scene. Um, and now I think culturally we're definitely moving out of that space. You know, people are just sort of into meditation and, and the unseen, and this idea that group consciousness and we're all connected and all of this stuff, which is all about. The, non, the non-physical and the unseen, I think, in terms of, again, for my mentalism, I would like to take it into more of that space, which I think, interestingly, is probably the more feminine. Like, if you look at, at things like material, it's like masculine logic and then instinct and femininity is more unseen. So I would like, to, as well, in terms of, yeah, in terms of um, mentalism to kind of maybe go into more of that space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's a really fascinating area. I think that makes it more interesting. And I think the idea of um, exposure, the way that the internet has exploded, the way that people, you know, you'll do a trick and people go, I'm going to Google that. Let me just, uh, oh, I'm go- I know how you did that. Or I know. And this idea that I know how you did that is important. It's kind of the least important thing. Because if yeah. you are immersed in what you're talking about, then there is no how did you do that. It's irrelevant. You can't go down that avenue. Whereas now it's like, well, I know those tricks. You know, I bought that from, I looked it up and the card box vanishes. I looked up card box vanishes on Google. I know how. So I watched this magician the other day and I saw him do, can I show it to you? And then you'll see this video, you know, it'll be like this. Um, I'm just showing my hands for those who listen on the podcast, no longer my face, and it's all there. And it's like, yeah, great. How wonderful. Mm. How engaging. Um, You've just proved that it's not interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I know, and I've been in that situation. I've been at, I remember being at a Halloween party with children performing, and I say children, they were like 13. So they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're children, but they're all on their phones and they're googling stuff and I'm like can you just let me leave before you start looking up all the methods and everything and it does you know it it does put a different spin on it and again it's that kind of it's 
it's social media that kind of you know short uh, satisfaction it's just you just consume stuff mm-hmm. you just want to consume and consume um and then you obviously just you miss out on the whole point and of then- the a feeling that you're getting and that you're trying as a magician you're trying to create a feeling and give someone a feeling and that um, makes it hard for you to do the thing that you just described the you know when you said being in the theatre show you needed like a year of working it developing it finding out what works doesn't work developing that character because even if the character and quite often even what you were saying with that other show with it was James's show the um was it James's show so what's the one that Neb directed oh Fergus Fergus's show where it's him but it's not really it's an, a heightened version of him it's him but yeah. a version of and yeah. um you've got to find your feet you've got to find and if 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 that show is then recorded at the beginning and put on social media as it happened it's not going to be what it could be what it becomes there's no time for development there's no time for maturing the act so that it can become this other thing and also you know like as you said it it's it's not it is fergus but it's it's a heightened version of him and then it's just kind of figuring out what bits of yourself you want to enhance and what you're doing inside of yourself to to create the performer that you you want to be um and I think, and, and it's, and yeah, I sort of, it is, it's, you never fully arrive. I think it's always like a journey of just keep on, keep on developing. I think that's a, a perfect note to end our discussion with keep on developing and keep going forward. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you feel that we've missed or you'd like to impart? I don't think so. Um... I think we've pretty much covered everything. No, I think it's a good place. It's where we started. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a good place to finish, I think. I think it is. So, Catherine Mills, it's been delightful as ever it is. And I <laughs> always enjoy our conversations. Funny, I've most of our cons- conversations are like this anyway. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they are. And, and they're, they're also uh, you know, on a video camera as well. <laughs> they, they are. Uh, just not recorded and put out for public consumption. So, uh, Catherine Mills can be found at catherinemills.com.co.uk. .co.uk. And uh, there's lots of stuff online if you Google her. And I'll, if there's any links, I'll put them up in the, the, the description. And uh, she's available for big gigs, for big corporate companies and private events. But uh, uh, definitely worth having at your event. And definitely a really creative thinker and always coming up with like pushing the envelope doing a little bit different i think and i think that's the de- how you've developed as a performer it's lovely to see so thank you very much Catherine. thanks paul and uh, <laughs> i hope to see you in person one day i hope so <laughs> we were allowed out yeah yeah all right and i'll end it there see you soon Bye.